Hello everyone. This talk has been produced for students of Malmo University. Students who I'll be meeting next week have been invited to give talks by uh, Professor Jonas Christiansen. Um, hi students, but also hello to anybody who's stumbled across this video by chance. My name is Magnus Fountain and I work for the University of Fechter where I teach social work. This is uh, the university's in northern Germany, but you're probably hearing my British accent, right? Um, I am uh, British born, uh, but I'm German trained, and maybe that's what's led to my interest in comparative European social work. If you want to find out more about me, you'll find my publications at the end of this presentation. Um, Jonas has invited me to give the students uh, a paper to read uh, before I actually come. Um, and I've chosen maybe an unusual text. I've chosen uh, chapter one from this book here, uh, which is written by Walter Lorenz, and it's called Social Work in a Changing Europe. And it's not a new book. It was published something like 25 years ago. Good. I think it's still relevant and I'll be talking about it in this presentation. A presentation basically has three parts. Firstly, I'm going to put uh, the book into the context of the time. When was this written and why was that a significant time? Then um, I want to think about the content of the book. What exactly is in chapter one of that text? Let's think about the topics that Lorenz introduces us to. Finally, um, he's citing some really interesting sources and I'll be saying a few more words about some of the authors whom he cites. Good, good. So that's the programme. This uh, home office shot video is going to be one of a couple. Uh, there will be a continuation of this video where I zoom in on the case of German, uh, the, the German welfare state and German social work. Good, good. Before I start, of course, I should note I am Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Saxons are famous for giving all the definitions at the beginning. So if that's what we do, that's what I'll do too. I won't disappoint. What is a welfare state? What's a welfare state exactly? I'm guessing that many of you will have a good feeling for this already. Maybe fun to actually jot down a few words in a moment, you know, press pause and jot down a few words, make your own ad hoc definition. If you do, I'm guessing yours will look something like this. This is uh, a definition that I found um, in a notable book, which I'll be discussing uh, later on anyway. And uh, Esping Anderson defines the welfare state as state responsibility for securing some basic modicum of welfare for its citizens. I want to zoom in on three of the words he chooses. What do you think of the words securing? What do you think of the word basic and modicum? Okay, so three words. Once again, press pause, scratch your head and think about the significance of those choices of word. What can we say about those words? Well, I think they're all pretty interesting. You might have had to look up the last one in a dictionary. Modicum is not really an everyday English word. A dictionary definition usually suggests that it means something like a little bit. A little bit typically of something nice. If you haven't heard this word before, don't worry. Um, would you like sugar in your tea, darling? Uh, just a modicum, love. Relax, nobody, nobody says that. But the word um, is worth noting here. I think it's borrowed from Marshall, another author we'll be considering later. And its place in that sentence kind of makes it saying the same thing twice. It's kind of like a tautology because basic also means a little bit. So as a German would say, it's doppelt gemoppelt, isn't it? I'm guessing uh, the choice of words here is simply to suggest that a welfare state isn't necessarily a generous amount of welfare. It can just be a little bit of basic welfare. Good. The word securing is also interesting. Um, securing means that the state doesn't necessarily provide the welfare. The welfare doesn't necessarily come from a state worker. The state's responsibility is for organizing it. So that's why we have the choice of the word securing. The state secures the welfare, doesn't necessarily provide it. Some states it does, in some it doesn't. And we'll come back to this point later on in the second talk when I talk about the interesting case of Germany. Good, let's move back to um, our topic, this particular book chapter. It's worth noting that Germans are keen Europeans. Germans often have a passion for Europe, and this is reflected in some really interesting writing on European social work from German authors. And I'm discussing Lorenz's book today, but it's probably worth drawing your attention to books written by his peers. In particular, if you're lucky enough to read German, I can really recommend this book by a gentleman called Peter 
appeared at. Um, if you can't read German, relax, he's co-edited other interesting volumes. So there you are, lots of writers, I can recommend many. Today though, let's return to uh, the writer of this book, Walter Lorenz. Now, I'm hoping I'm saying his name right, I'm hoping my pronunciation is okay. My English mouth often struggles with German names. If I do say it wrong, that's probably quite charming. Uh, the background is uh, Walter Lorenz has actually worked as a social worker in England. And he then worked as a scholar, as a lecturer and researcher in Ireland. So he's really quite celebrated amongst uh, Anglo-Saxon authors. They often cite him. Um, and if they talk about him, they might even anglicise his name anyway. So you often get Walter Lorenz, kind of half anglicised, or even Walter Lorenz. Good, good. I actually studied social work in Germany. Funnily enough, his name wasn't mentioned once in the course of my three years at the university, suggesting that maybe Lorenz's ideas are more celebrated outside of his home country. If that's the case, I guess that's a punishment for not spending much of his adult life at home. Bless him. Good. So an interesting author who I can really investigate, uh, I can really encourage you to investigate and delve into. Let's think about the context now, the context of him writing this book. I'm guessing he wrote that book in the early 1990s, um, probably 1992, 1993. I'm old enough to actually remember that period. That's when I was completing my schooling. Smells like teen spirit, Achtung baby. I was there. You might not have been, and if you weren't, it's well worth pausing for a few moments and thinking about that particular period in European history. How? was Europe changing in the early 1990s? And this leads to another question, are there parallels to today? Yeah, what do you think? Maybe my references to uh, Seattle and Dublin-based rock bands confused you. Let's, let's think about Germany. I always, I always tease Germans, um, I have to, being born British, when Brits talk about music with Germans, they don't talk about Nirvana or U2 we have to ask about David Hasselhoff. The 1990s was a time when the Hoff was at the peak of his fame in Germany. Um, bizarre but true, you can check this on YouTube if you don't believe me, um, the Hoff actually gave a concert on the Berlin Wall singing his song Freedom, which became a kind of anthem for the Germans. What am I alluding to here? Of course, the 1990s, the time of German reunification. So how was Europe changing in the early 1990s? In terms of European community, you know, Germany had been pushed onto the, the hard eastern border of that unit. Suddenly the Iron Curtain was falling and Europe was becoming a much bigger place. Now, as I've already said, Germans, enthusiastic Europeans, um, they enjoyed a great deal of European integration over the preceding years, and presumably in the early 1990s, this was something that was clearly going to continue, um, and I'm guessing that some kind of enlargement of the European Union was also foreseeable, excuse me, the European community back then. Good. On the other hand, wasn't all positive. There were tensions in the early 1990s. Uh, the cost of reunification for Germany was obviously quite enormous and that would have been causing anxiety. There were other political tensions. There were racial tensions at that time. Um, there were patterns of migration, which uh, would have made some people anxious. So a whole lot of reasons for a bit of future angst, a bit of future anxiety. I wasn't in Germany back then, I was uh, back in the UK still. Um, also an interesting time where different people had different feelings about what was going on. Um, the same year that Lorenz published his book was actually the year that the Channel Tunnel, underneath the channel linking England to France, that was actually completed in that year in 1994. So uh, I'm sure uh, a traumatic moment for poor Boris Johnson. You know, suddenly the relationship between this island and the continent was, was a different one. You know, Britain was, was bound to the continent. This was a kind of umbilical cord linking the two together. So yeah, an interesting change somehow the UK losing its island status. On the other hand, um, to give a balance, um, there were very mixed and ambivalent feelings about the, the Europe project. 
Britain had always been a somewhat reluctant and ambivalent member compared to other European states. Um, in the very early 1990s, the government was uh, using interest rates to link the pound to the Deutschmark. The idea being that Britain would be well prepared to be uh, a member of some future European currency. It's called the AQ back then. Of course, now it's the euro. Um, and that ended in tears in the early 1990s. It, the economic trickery uh, didn't actually work. Uh, and that would have been a reason why some people would have been skeptical about future developments. So yeah, also on, on the other side of the channel, future anxieties. But certainly the big picture would be a picture of uh, a Europe which is, which is growing and which is enjoying higher levels of integration. Parallels to today, well, it's quite shocking, isn't it, really? Exactly a generation later. I'm actually recording this video in September 2019. Um, when I read the, the paper in the mornings, uh, I read about Boris Johnson's attempts to create a hard Brexit come hell or high water. Um, it, it's gloomy stuff, indeed. Only the, the pesky questions of legality or democracy uh, are stopping him. So, yeah anxious times, not only for the Brits, also for our European friends. One commonality though is obviously a, some kind of turning point, some kind of change in European history. That's the, the commonality between then and now. Good, it's probably enough talk about the context. Let's jump into this book chapter. What does Lewis actually discuss in his opening book chapter? And I might ask a second question actually, how did you find it? How did you find it? Um, I, I read it as a German and I'm kind of acclimatised to that German style of academic writing. In a sense, I quite love it. Um, and it is very, very typical of the style of German writing. Um, what does he do? Um, he, he writes long, interesting sentences, drawing together big ideas. He's kind of hopping about in terms of the things he talks about. He covers a, a wide range of areas in that chapter scooting around, delving into this, delving into that. He presupposes a, a high level of, of pre-knowledge on the reader's part, so the readers are expected to follow his arguments, even if they're complex. Yeah, as I say, typically German, um, I, I utterly love it, but it may be a little bit exotic if it's the first time you're reading a German author. Good! In terms of uh, content, his paper really kickstarts with an interesting big idea. He knows the, the, the social work profession is quite universal. You know, it has similarities in lots of places. Social work training, for example, is not that different in different places. Whether you train in, in England or in Spain, you've got you know, core modules, you've got social work methods, you've got a bit of psychology, you've got a bit of sociology and so on. So we're a well-established and a distinct profession with similarities everywhere. But, but social work is embedded in the state, in the nation state, specifically in the welfare state. And again, the welfare state, England and Spain, let's say, you know, that's like chalk and cheese, isn't it? You've got very different welfare traditions there. So a kind of paradox kickstarts the chapter and kickstarts the book. What does Lorenz talk about next? He jumps into a history of social welfare. Um, I find it quite beautiful because I love the way he, he plucks examples from different countries. So he talks about Holland here, Spain there, Italy, Sweden, and so on. It isn't, isn't that nice? This uh, draws us into a discussion of the welfare state in terms of social rights, citizenship and social rights. And that's language which he uses uh, to, to lead us forward into his discussion. A topic that's mentioned kind of in passing, but is quite significant. Um, there's a question in, in that chapter, how does it work in particular countries? Are social workers employed by the state? You know, are they working for the state, the public sector, or are they employed independently in NGOs, in charities, in charitable organisations? So that's an interesting contrast, which is going to be relevant in my second video as well. He introduces welfare state typologies. In other words, we've got systems whereby we can categorize different welfare states. And he introduces uh, one system, um, gives examples of this. And if we can categorize welfare states, then we can look at how each welfare state category or type shapes its own social work. And that's something he talks about in depth. 
There's a discussion about decentralization in passing, a trend from the 1960s in many states. And then he brings us up to date with a current trend. He was writing in the 1990s, but already the influence of neoliberalism was being felt. Now, actually, my list is horribly incomplete. There's so much in that book chapter, I can't mention everything. But this is what I want to, to focus on for now. Good. I've promised to talk about some of the things that Lorenz is interested in, some of the author's ideas that he cites. And this is maybe a nice place to start. He's quoting a, a 1990s reprint of a book uh, originally published in 1950, excuse me, of an essay published in 1950, because this really is a published essay, by a British sociologist called T.H. Marshall. Now, the context were, was the post-war years in Britain. So we've got a kind of Western welfare capitalism context here. And Marshall is tracing the evolution of the welfare state in terms of the evolution of citizens' rights. In the British context, this is quite interesting um, because the welfare state is being framed in terms of people's social rights, and there's a kind of natural link, therefore, to the project or the movement of social democracy in Britain, the Labour movement, the Labour Party even. So this is quite curious. The welfare state understood in the way in which the citizen has rights, and not just those civic and political rights, but also social rights. So an interesting uh, British perspective on the welfare state, linking it to the project of social democracy. And this thinking is maybe a nice stepping stone to our next author. Now we're, we're jumping back to Scandinavia. This is a Danish uh, sociologist and political scientist, uh, Esping Andersen. Esping Andersen is, is probably most famous for this book here which uh, was very new when Lorenz was writing his book chapter. So this would have been only a couple of years old, very recently published. This book was much celebrated in the 1990s. It was a very influential work. The title, The Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism. Maybe it's worth uh, describing this in terms of how we'd thought about the welfare state beforehand. Now, a lot of people rather naively looked at welfare states as being somehow on some kind of linear scale. So some welfare states were big, let's say, some were small, and some were, were in between. And this rather simplistic way of looking at welfare states isn't so interesting. Uh, Esping Anderson was uh, using the ideas of a couple of earlier thinkers who proposed that we could categorise the welfare state by the type, the principles, the organisation. So Esping Anderson thought maybe all the welfare states we have in the Western capitalist world of the 1980s, maybe all of those welfare states could be categorized. So he had a theory, Western capitalist welfare states can often be clearly placed into one of these three distinct clusters. So he made little groups of different welfare states, three in particular. And the magic of his work, he did empirical research, he did statistics, he did number crunching. He had a wonderful number crunching tool called decommodification to measure the way in which social rights are granted in a particular system. And his number crunching enabled him to actually place most of the welfare states he was looking at in one of these three particular categories. So his research gave very satisfying results. So he's empirically demonstrated something really quite fascinating. Yes, the welfare state is about giving people social rights, but which social rights I get, so the type of rights and the extent of these rights, that's gonna be different in different places, and it's gonna be measurably different. So a quite fascinating concept. Good. Um, Lorenz is quoting Esping Anderson a fair bit, and I find some of his quotes very, very fitting. And this particular point, which I want to talk about next, um, really changed the way in which I look at the question of inequality in society. Inequality and stratification. Now, I don't know if you, if you know that word stratification. Um, if you're standing on a beach and you look at a cliff, a stone is often in strata, it's in layers. 
and a kind of 1980s model for looking at people in society from an economical perspective is to say that some are richer than others and we can grade people into strata or even we can say social classes you know uh, working class lower middle class upper middle class and so on so we kind of categorize people in a kind of linear way according to their incomes where does this come from you know why are some people rich why are some people poor some people may think this is a kind of uh, instinctive way of looking at it some people may think oh that's just how nature is you know there's a, there's a natural inequality societies will naturally have some poor people and some richer people Esping Anderson is questioning whether this is natural so he questions the conventional wisdom and he kind of turns it on his head he says it's not at all natural on the contrary it's man-made Excuse my bad language, I've chosen that formulation quite deliberately, it's man-made. How is it man-made? It's created by the welfare states, it's created by the social policy that our politicians have chosen. In other words, he's saying the welfare state is not there to correct some kind of pre-existing inequality. On the contrary, the welfare state creates the social stratification in the first place. It's a provocative idea. Esping Anderson is claiming that each state gets the stratification that it wishes for, wishes for in inverted commas, in the sense that the Brits are wishing for Brexit. So the state wishes for a certain kind of strat stratification and produces it through its social policy, through its welfare state. Let's, let's examine this claim with the case of the UK. I'm quoting some of Esping Anderson's uh, language here. He encourages us to look at the UK poor law tradition. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the UK poor laws. The UK is fascinating in social policy because it has an old organised system of welfare. That system has important Elizabethan roots. And, uh, with Elizabethan, I mean Elizabeth I back in the time of Shakespeare, so like 400 years ago. So we had organised welfare back then with poor laws. Good. These uh, poor laws were reformed um, in a time just before Queen Victoria, so I think it's the, the 1830s, and we call these the new poor laws. The centrepiece of those poor laws was making provision for widespread poverty in a rapidly industrialising Britain. Industrialisation led to a great deal of poverty. And the poor laws reformed the way in which poor people could be given arms. Basically, the idea of giving arms was pretty much scrapped in favour of another form of institutional help. That form of institutional help was the workhouse. So the Victorian period was famous for these notorious workhouses everywhere. You might be familiar with them from literature. Think of Oliver Twist, for example. And whilst reading that, you might say to yourself, well, there can't have been many of these workhouses. You know, these were for a select, very unfortunate few. Forget that idea. There were these workhouses all over Britain. There was a network of them. And if you look at every British family tree, you'll find people that have lived in a workhouse. And I can, I can say myself, um, I actually have a great grandfather and a great, great grandmother born in the workhouse. It's completely normal. So the poor laws tradition, this rather punishing, you know, punitive welfare, stigmatizing the recipients who would avoid it if they could. Esping Anderson notes, the poor relief tradition was conspicuously designed for purposes of stratification. By punishing and stigmatizing recipients, it promotes social dualisms. So, you know, the Brits were, were splitting their society, they were splitting their nation into separate groups quite deliberately. They were steering it that way. They got the, the inequality they wanted. It's a provocative idea, isn't it? We've talked about the case of Britain. Let's investigate Britain's welfare state regime. You know, what kind of world or form of welfare is it? Um, Esping Addison calls it liberal. Quite easy to note because you can think of neoliberalism, which is linked to this interest in liberalism. Walter Lawrence picks another term. He talks about it as being a residual welfare state form. But the meaning in each case is very, very similar. Examples, I've mentioned the UK, much of what I say now is true for the US as well, and even other English-speaking countries. 
historical roots, that welfare that we've just discussed, that punitive welfare. Um, that welfare then, and our, our modern welfare now, encourages self-help, but sometimes it even forces self-help. An interesting feature of the liberal model is that it's welfare not for the whole society. It's welfare for the poor, for the very poor. The middle class are not really in the system. And this would have been quite clear by the 1980s when Esping Anderson was carrying out his research. By that time, the British middle classes were, were quite interested in, in getting their own private pensions. The state pension was clearly not going to be adequate. And they were having private health care, so they didn't have to use the sometimes uh, lacking public system. Their children were not educated in, in, in the normal schools, but rather in more expensive private schools. So there's, there's a, a UK-US habit whereby the middle classes try to leave their system if they can. So the welfare state is kind of like a welfare state for the lower half of society. So peculiarity of this liberal model. Good. It's interesting to think about the welfare state because the, our question is, what kind of social work does that produce? What kind of social work do we have in this rather punishing, stigmatising welfare state? Lorenz's uh, language is quite gloomy. It really is quite sobering, I warn you. So it's, it's not nice to hear, but I, I think it was fair for 1994. Um, and it's worth noting, I think it's still completely fair today. What does Lorenz note? He says, UK social workers work almost exclusively with the poor. So if you are middle class, you might never see a social worker in your life. The mandate was those earlier poor laws, so it really is in that logic, it's in that tradition. There's a preoccupation with child protection, I should add, at the expense of family services, at the expense of prevention. So it's not really preventative, it's more reactive. And he notes there's a market social pathology approach, you know, so we tend to look at the client in terms of deficits, in terms of shortcomings and weaknesses. He adds, UK social workers have limited resources to grant their clients social rights. So much as they would like to, in terms of the services that they can offer, it's fairly minimal. So the, the kind of continental idea of family support, parenting support, various forms of relief, various forms of prevention, that's not really in the modern UK tradition. Instead, Lorenz is stressing that social workers have uh, big controlling duties. So they have responsibilities which are mainly in the area of controlling. The caring part of social work, that other part of social work, the caring bit, that's left to others. Now, it may be left to uh, informal care, family members, let's say, or friends. It may be left to the work of volunteers, or in a broader sense, paid workers from voluntary sector organisations, or of course, the private sector. So social work, very much for controlling duties. So if you think of uh, UK social work, think about case management, think about very much reactive help rather than preventative help, and think about help for a certain group of people in society, not your whole population as it may be elsewhere. So it's a strange and, and maybe quite, quite different form of social work to that which some of you, depending on your nationality, are familiar with. Good, good. I'm just flicking through my notes here. Let me move on. Um, an interesting contrast, of course, is if we look at social work in the, the context of the Nordic welfare state. Um, yeah, I shouldn't really be saying much about the Nordic welfare state. I don't need to. You know it uh, very well. Uh, many of you are actually sitting in a Nordic country right now. Um, it's worth noting, I shouldn't talk about it anyway. I'm bringing coal to Newcastle, aren't I? This is something that you guys all know a lot about already. But it's nice to repeat it in case anybody is unsure. Um, the Nordic model famously focuses on supporting employment. Um, back in the 1980s, this was quite striking in the area of female labour market participation. Uh, Nordic mothers were mostly working. And back then, a fascinating contrast with the case of Germany. Germany in the 1980s was so much a country of Hausfrauen. Good. So that's uh, an interesting point. So it's focused on employment. Um, having a population mostly in employment means that there's this tax revenue for extensive support services. So you have extensive welfare services, extensive family services. 
who then speaks about this, I'm, I'm feeling a bit of passion here, social services exist to promote democracy and solidarity and assistance is an entitlement. So a stark contrast of the case of the UK. In the case of the UK, assistance is something for very, very poor, very needy people, and it's given in a rather stigmatizing sense. In the Nordic countries, the exact opposite. You need help, sure, you're a citizen, you have that entitlement to the assistance if you need it. So a fascinating contrast. What kind of social work does this kind of welfare state lead to? Traditionally, it was public sector services. So a generation ago, the Nordic countries really had welfare states in a quite literal sense. It was public sector workers delivering those welfare services. I really should stress this has changed dramatically in recent decades, especially in recent years. Good. Lorenz notes that social workers are part of an extensive set of welfare services. It's multidisciplinary, so they're working with people from other disciplines, supporting individuals, supporting families. My last point a second or two ago about uh, how the Nordic model is changing draws us to a really important closing thought. I've, I've tried to take a path here, kind of and not stumble into the various traps ahead of me. Um, comparative social welfare, comparative social work, there's the danger of making generalizations. And I'll try to avoid that, but I've, I've stepped into that trap, I'm sure. Another big danger is suggesting that these different forms or types of welfare state are somehow static and unchanging. Quite the opposite is true. The reality is that welfare is constantly shifting, it's constantly morphing. In the context of the early 1990s, um, one of Walter Lorenz's closing thoughts in, in, in the first chapter of the book is how neoliberalism was on the ascent, it was on the rise. Um, the context there, uh, the, the Thatcher, Reagan, new right of the 1980s. So neoliberalism was really coming in Britain, America, it was clearly already there. You could see it. You could see it with privatized services. You could see it with these, these markets, mixed markets of care and welfare. So instead of the state providing a service, the state would just contract in another agency, maybe an NGO, maybe a private sector agency to provide that, that service. So a real shift. Things were being radically shaken up, a time of, of, of quickly changing social policy. Good. Well, I think it makes sense for us to come to a close here. Talk two is going to zoom in on the fascinating case of the German welfare state, which is really interesting um, and how it shapes German social work. As promised, uh, the literature, um, the, the book I gave you to read um, has been translated into Swedish and into Italian. If you speak one of those two languages, uh, pick up the book in your mother tongue. You'll really enjoy reading it, I'm sure. Um, and as promised, it's also a selection my publications. Thank you.